Lots of people use the term codependency. But what is it? If you've ever felt responsible for the happiness of another person or an incessant need to fix people's problems so you can be loved, stay tuned. On this episode of Navigating Narcissism, I'm welcoming gifted author Dr. Priscilla Gilman, whose beautiful memoir, The Critic's Daughter, is a roadmap of what she calls her codependent journey. Though her childhood appeared happy from the outside, Priscilla was tasked with her family's emotional burdens from a very young age. At the age of nine, she took on the impossible responsibility of her dad's well-being after he told her he would have taken his life if not for her and her sister. Priscilla's journey is an important reminder. We never know what's happening behind closed doors of what may look like the most loving families and ultimately, None of us can be responsible for another person's happiness or sadness. From Red Table Talk Podcast and iHeartMedia, I'm Dr. Romani, and this is Navigating Narcissism. This podcast should not be used as a substitute for medical or mental health advice. Individuals are advised to seek independent medical advice, counseling, and or therapy from a healthcare professional with respect to any medical condition, mental health issue, or health inquiry, including matters discussed on this podcast. This episode discusses suicidal ideation, which may be triggering to some people. The views and opinions expressed are solely those of the podcast author or individuals participating in the podcast and do not represent the opinions of Red Table Talk Productions, iHeartMedia, or their employees. Priscilla Gilman, welcome to Navigating Narcissism. It is such a pleasure to have you. I've had the you know exquisite pleasure of reading your book, oh. The Critic's Daughter. What I really love about it is there is a subtlety and a relatability to it. Because this show, as you know, Priscilla, is called yeah. Navigating <laughs> Narcissism, right? But that's a very, very vast umbrella. And I think one of the hardest things about any kind of story about a family and what happens with parents. Yes, yes. It's not black and white. And when people exactly. find themselves in the gray, they often yes. don't know how to see what went wrong, but also, most importantly, how all of that shaped them. For anyone who doesn't know you and hasn't read the book, can you tell us who your parents are? So my father, Richard Gilman, was a professor at the Yale School of Drama for 30 years. He was the drama critic for Newsweek in the 60s. He was the literary editor of The New Republic in the 60s, the theater critic for The Nation in the 80s, the president of Pan America, very, but didn't even have a BA. So a self-made, self-taught person. Mm -hmm. And my mother, Lynn Nesbitt, who is still alive, um, was is a very prominent literary agent. Her clients, when I was a child, included Toni Morrison, Hunter S. Thompson, Tom Wolfe, Michael Crichton, Anne Rice, now Robert Caro, Jimmy Carter, um, a whole host of incredible writers and people. As I read your book, going to be honest, <laughs> I envied. I envied you, you know, because I had a very different experience of, of these kinds of parental relationships and certainly of early childhood. But there was an envy. And here you were sort of hanging out with, you know, people that are my personal <laughs> heroes, Toni Morrison, Joan Didion, <laughs> the kinds of people who are giving you dolls. And, and so <laughs> yeah. you were, you know, you were playing make believe with your father. I think the thing that struck me, though, most about the story of your father is how attentive he was. He would watch you perform. He was interested in what you did. He asked you questions yes. about yourself. He took delight in what you in, in what you were learning about. Most kids never would get a parent ever in their lives to be interested in sitting down and watching them do a play. That doesn't happen to them once in their childhood, right? And that yes. happens to you almost every day. In yes. the same breath, there was this remarkable strictness about what you, especially small children, what you ate, um, uh, the kinds of uh, media you watched, uh, yeah. you know, everything, the music you listened to. So could yes. you paint a picture of the complexity 
of who your father was, especially when you were a young child. I love how you started, Dr. Romney, by talking about Shades of Grey. And I had one reader say to me, um, you've written a book about human beings and all their complexity and all their messiness in a world that wants to make look at things in terms of black and white. And my father was, he was this mass of contradictions, which is part of what made him so fascinating and so compelling. He was exceptionally attentive to me and my younger sister. I have a sister who's 14 months younger, my best friend still, um, really invested in our imaginative play, would say, would ask us questions about what our dolls or our Paddingtons were doing that day, would come in and watch. We would have auditions for doll and stuffed animal productions of West Side Story or Oklahoma, and he would come in and assess them. And he would read to us for hours on end. And he was just clearly in love with our world. He was invested in us as children, but also in the realm of childhood per se. He took genuine enjoyment. He would sit down and watch Sesame Street and Zoom. And you know all these shows, Dr. Ron. I did. <laughs> I watched Company, them. I watched them. Mr. Rogers, right? But you're so right that he was very strict. Uh, we were not allowed to watch any television except PBS. Uh, and he did not allow us to listen to any pop music. When Grease came out, you probably remember this. I do. Um, all my friends at school were going to see Grease. They had their, their Grease cast albums. We were not allowed to listen to that. My father did support me in reading like the Hardy Boys series and the Nancy Drew series, but a lot of other sort of popular mass market stuff. We would never be allowed to have like Sweet Valley High or Babysitter's Club or anything like that. What I hear though was it was a childhood that at least in the broad strokes, yeah, what was a, it was safe it was yes. predictable. It yes. was it was comforting. You were seen, you were heard, you were yep. valued. Yes. When did things start to change? So the fissures that I saw, these slight fissures, almost imperceptible, I agree with you. Uh, my father, I could tell, was prone to depression. He suffered from writer's block. He smoked compulsively. Um, I could sense when he needed a cigarette. He started to get irritable. He had a temper. He would get angry. And it was rare. And I always felt that I was the one who was best able to coax him out of a bad mood, Dr. Romani. And so from a very young age, um, I felt that my role in the family, my sister was a little bit more difficult. She didn't sleep through the night. She would have temper tantrums. And my role always in the family unit was to be the good girl, the cheerful girl, the smiling girl, the helpful one, the one who steadied everybody else. I And then I all, also always sensed that my parents didn't love each other the way married couples in movies or books that I was reading, or even some of my friends' parents loved each other. There was no physical affection between them. My father always seemed to crave my mother's good opinion. My mother seemed a little distant from my father. She was very warm with me and my sister, but not with my father. My father was a very funny person, but he never made her laugh the way he made other people laugh. So I started thinking, something just doesn't feel right. But we would ask them again and again, uh, are you going to get divorced? If they would have a fight, or we would hear about a family friend getting divorced, and they would always say, we will never, ever get divorced. And then as you know, they did, but it took a long time. So when I was 10, in the fall of 1980, um, my mother announced that she was ending the marriage. And it, it was a night in October, I will never forget vividly sitting in my room, I heard my parents talking in the kitchen. I couldn't really hear the words. And I'm writing in my journal, I have a Holly Hobby journal. And I have the puppy that we've just gotten. And that was another source of stress because my mother didn't want a dog. So I was thinking, oh, are they fighting about the dog? But my mother is not happy that we have this puppy now. And then my mother summoned me and my sister into the kitchen. And my father had left. And she announced to us that my parents were going to do what they called a trial separation. Uh, my sister immediately starts, gets very upset. And I try to stay calm. And I'm digging my nails into my tights to keep from crying. And I knew that it wasn't a trial separation. I knew this was false comfort. 
that was being given to us, that this was not an experiment, that there was something definitive. And my mother looked at peace in a way that I had never seen her before. I want to ask you a few questions about that entire sequence. You said, I dug my fingers into my tights to keep from crying. What would have happened if you did cry and they saw you cry? That's such a great question. I never cried as a mm -hmm. kid. I, I, it was kind of legendary in the family that I was the baby who never cried and my sister was the baby who cried. And I, you know, I think that my father suffered from untreated clinical depression for sure. And I was blessed, I was lucky that I had this naturally kind of optimistic, buoyant temperament. Mm -hmm. But I also think that I leaned into that and I was cast in the role of the happy one who doesn't cry, who makes ever other people feel better. Mm -hmm. And I think that if I had cried in that mm -hmm. moment, it would have disconcerted my mom and my sister. And my sister would have cried more if mm -hmm. I had started to cry. Mm -hmm. But it's just, it's so interesting. I, I don't know. I wouldn't have been able to go and comfort my dad, which is what I did next. Now you've taken to another interesting place. And this is something we often see in any family system, right? Children do get cast into roles based on their temperaments, right? Yes. And that child with the easy temperament, the well-sleeping, not crying, optimistic, yep. constantly cheerful child, they, they perceive that that is a very valued role. Like that's a good exactly. part to have landed in this play called This Family. Yeah. <laughs> and so yes. it's a safe role. To cry would have been to violate that role. But even as we're talking here, you can see the danger of that role, right? Because Absolutely. now what's being rewarded is emotional constraint, number one. Exactly. And number yep. two is that your value comes from displacing your emotion in yeah. favor of a caregiving role and not inconveniencing anyone. And, exactly. right? and no one yes. ever sat you down, Priscilla, and said, hey, Priscilla, we need you to not <laughs> cry and not inconvenience yeah. us. It was a perception, but these yes. roles can give a child a sense of place and safety and your temperament work. Now I want to go to this next piece here, which is I knew that I didn't want to want my sister to cry more. So you felt responsible for your sister's emotion. I can yeah. understand that. Siblings feel that. However, your father, a grown man, you really were trying to protect him. Can you talk about your role as your the protector of your father's emotion and frankly, your father? And when did that role kick in for you? It's so interesting. Parallel to my sense of being completely seen and safe mm -hmm. and accepted mm -hmm. and loved from my true and best self by my father, I always felt that my father's well-being, his emotional well-being, even his physical well-being was precarious. And I always worried about the smoking from a very young age. Uh, and he would drink, not excessively, but he would have to have his drink every day at a certain time when his mood started to potentially go south. And I, from a, I talk in the book about becoming a football fan to give my father company. I wrote a letter to a football player when I was nine years old after we had seen the Giants lose and the football player, Harry Carson, was had his head in his hands and was looked like he was sobbing on the sidelines. And I wrote a letter and I said, um, don't be sad. You're a wonderful player and a wonderful man. We'll all be happy again. And I realize now that I was writing this to Harry Carson, but I was also writing this to my father. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this was a year before the separation, oh. but I was already sensing my father is somebody who's prone to sadness, prone to depression. Mm -hmm. And I also want to call you out on something else here, Priscilla. It was a word <laughs> usage you had used, okay? It's a mm -hmm. Dr. Romney moment here when we're calling you out. <laughs> I love the Dr. Okay. Romney moment. Okay, so, you know, that letter you wrote to the football player really hit me hard. And in fact, if I remember correctly, he had even sent you a photo of him or something that you hung over your he bed. He did. He said, God yeah. bless you always, yeah. old 53, yes. But what you wrote was to him, you, you said, you mustn't be sad. Oh. So that's very different. 
weighing in much more heavily, trying to kind of run the emotional sort of show. Yeah, it was. And you were very invested in this man's emotional state. You didn't even know him. But I do think he was a representation <laughs> of your father, someone who was he played for the Giants. The love of the Giants was something that was really shared between you and your dad in many ways an interest you took on to facilitate a greater closeness with your father. Absolutely. And that's something yes. we will see with children who come from environments where they do sort of take emotional responsibility for their parents. They start to cultivate interests that are in line with what their parents like. They'll take up a sport their parent likes. They will, they will read books their parent likes. In this case, you watched uh, sports the way your father likes, and it really created a lifelong, you know, sort of point of connection. It was a wonderful yes. thing. But once again, you were chasing what mattered to him. Maybe I was perceiving a big shock, a big sadness is about to come. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm, I'm going to mm -hmm. get you through this. We're going to soldier through this. And I'm going to make sure that we get out on the other side. And we're happy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I didn't focus on how these things affected me mm -mm. because I was so plugged into, oh my gosh, Clary, my sister, um, she's more vulnerable. She's little. I have to protect her. I don't want her to you know, upset my parents more by crying mm -hmm. because her crying would upset them. And then my mother, you know, we, she sort of ends the scene and says, it's just going to be for, he's going to be here for a few more months. And, you know, it's not happening immediately. And she takes my sister off to bed. And I saw my father with his shoulders shaking from the back, walking mm -hmm. down the hall. And I went after him and I thought I have to, because what's going to happen if I don't? And I walk into his office and I kept thinking, he's about to be expelled from this. Mm -hmm. He's about to be literally expelled from this apartment, literally expelled from this office, and he's about to lose our family. And he was crying and he beckoned me to him and I had not seen him cry very often at all. And he was crying and he said, I don't want this, but I don't want to lose our family. Mm -hmm. And he mm -hmm. was crying and crying and crying and I snuffed up my tears. I remember just like aggressively trying to keep the tears from coming out and snuffing them up because I thought that that would make it worse for him. It's, I mean, that's an incredibly powerful moment and powerful awareness to think of how young you were. You said you were around 10, I believe, 10, right? I 10. Was in fifth grade. You're in fifth yeah. grade, 10 years old. You're getting a piece of news which is catastrophic for a child to hear, especially a child who actually was really content in her in her family space. Yes. And you are entirely focused on your father's well-being, what he's about to lose, watching the you know the the heaviness of of his hunched over back. I mean, you picked up on all those physical cues. How did yep. you manage, Priscilla, the juxtaposition between your father's absolute sense of despair and defeat that day? You saw all that he was going to lose, and what you saw as your mom's sense of relief. I don't want to quite say happiness, but you definitely saw your mother felt like she put a weight down and felt lighter and your father yes. took on the weight of the world. How did you, at 10 years old, negotiate that difference, that tension? My mother, obviously, a huge trailblazer in publishing and a major career and was not around as much when I was little as my father was and was not invested in childhood and, and playing with children in the way that my father was. But I always felt very protective of my mother. I, I sensed at a young age that she was a woman in a man's world. She was going out to work and she was under a lot of pressure. My father was very supportive of her in that and always told us girls like, don't make too much noise, you know, she needs to work. Um, he was very ahead of his time in being yeah. totally comfortable with the woman, the woman's power and going out in the world and working. And I, my mother was tired a lot. She was stressed a lot. And I, so I felt happy in a weird way that my mom seemed relieved and she seemed mm. less tired and she seemed her she seemed better to me and so i and i didn't want to make her feel guilty yeah about this decision that she had made because i could see that she had needed to make it i just sensed it there was something about her body language that told me this is something that she had been wanting to do for a while mm -hmm. and this is something she needed to do to save herself in some way. 
So that's a rem- remarkable, and I'm like, I'm drawing out that remarkable <laughs> amount of empathy <laughs> for a 10-year-old child. Most adults could not engage in the balanced circumspection, and I would, I maybe even not balance. You were, you were making allowances for everyone's different positions. Your mother's yeah. relief, your father's despair, uh, your sister's anguish. The only emotion that wasn't being accounted for was yours. Yep. But you were simultaneously able to literally make that adjustment. The adjustment. Don't want mom to feel guilty because I can see that she's okay. Uh, want dad to feel okay. In adults, we would view that as quite a skill, right? And in fact, that's actually <gasps> yeah. a shrink skill. That a sh- and but the difference between a shrink and what you were doing is a <laughs> shrink is an adult. <laughs> who went to school for many years and is objective. They're not in that family. Most 10-year-olds would be enraged, upset, devastated, and run to their room and cry and would not give a damn about the mental state of either of their parents. And what you did was literally the opposite. You became so invested in your father's emotional world and well-being, especially at the point that the, the trial separation and subsequent divorce happened, was he equally plugged into your emotional world and equally aware of your emotional world and responsive to it? I don't think he was in those couple of months after this night where my mother breaks the devastating news. My father has moved out. I don't know where he's living. Mm. Uh, we're not told. He doesn't have an steady apartment where we can come over for sleepovers. We're only seeing him for these like rushed lunches and dinners on the Upper West Side. And then my mother goes to California on business and my father is allowed to come back and stay in the apartment for a few days. And he got upset with my sister one night when she was crying and we were playing a game. And he she spilled some apple juice on the Monopoly board and started to cry and he got mad and he yelled. And then I went to find him And he was apologizing, essentially, for getting angry, Mm -hmm. and which he always did. And that's Mm -hmm. the thing about my dad. He had a temper, but he knew he had a temper. He didn't justify it. He he felt very guilty about it. And he said to me, you know that I love you girls more than anything in the world. And I said, of course, daddy, of course. And he said, sometimes I think I'd kill myself if it wasn't for you girls. And that was like a moment where it just was imprinted on me that my father's survival is my responsibility Mm -hmm. and I'm gonna do everything it takes to make sure that he stays alive. And, you know, when we would have these lunches and dinners with him, he would get irritable sometimes, he would rush us through our meals, he was struggling financially, so he would make us split a dish at a restaurant and my sister would say, but I'm hungry, that's not enough food. And I would kick her to try to get her to be quiet and I, I once and I would see him in McDonald's taking the packets of salt and sugar and ketchup and putting them in his bag. And I thought, this is really alarming. Like he doesn't have enough money to buy these things on his own. He's taking them from the restaurant. And he never asked us, how are you handling the split or anything like that? Mm. Neither of my parents ever said, how do you feel about this? And we were not to talk about our feelings about my dad not being there. So it just it just didn't come up. And my parents didn't, you know, there was, this was 1980, 1981, um, Kramer versus Kramer generation. You know, there just wasn't any discourse about how to talk about divorce. Very few of my parents, yeah. my friends at school had parents who would split up. I felt ashamed. So I just didn't talk about it. It was a different time, but you're a mom, all right? I'm a mom. <laughs> yeah. And <laughs> when you think about the, the the fact that the your parents split up, father goes elsewhere, everything has changed, and nobody is checking in on you and your sister. How do you feel about that now? It is completely shocking to mm-hmm. me. Like, when I looked back at this, um, my kids are now, they're so old. I am divorced from their father. I did my divorce completely differently. We mm-hmm. nested for a few years we have joint custody, we're good friends, we're, you know, my parents had the most bitter, most mm-hmm. vicious divorce that was extended over many years as they fought over money and uh, they could hardly bear to be in the same room with each other. I did it completely differently. But one thing when I looked back, um, my agent, she said to me, I really want you to realize 
how little you were. Yes. And thinking, wow, I was so little. Okay, so I want to build on that. Nine, nine years old. I was around nine, ten years old. That your father, in the midst of his despair, said to you, if it wasn't for you and your sister, I would kill myself. You're a mother. You know what nine looks like from a parental perspective. (laughs) I know you love your dad. I really do. And I get it. After hearing the childhood you have, I get it. But when you look at that now, that utterance, that one line, if it weren't for you and your sister, I would kill myself. You're nine. How do you feel about that now? And more importantly, how did that shape you from that point forward? You know, I still look at it with with empathy mm-hmm. in the sense that it was a moment where he was just completely broken. Yeah, I heard that. He had been momentarily inserted back into the home while my mother was away, which probably, and he was in that space, the same room that she had made the announcement two months earlier. I think he felt so overwhelmed with shame and guilt mm-hmm. about having gotten angry at Claire. He probably felt this is my one chance to be with yeah, them and I screwed yeah, it up Yeah, because I got upset, you know, and and I get that. And he, I think he felt under an enormous amount of pressure. And in that moment, he just broke and he said something that he should not have said to me, but he was lost. I just looked at his face and there was just anguish scoring his face and he just blurted it out. And in general, he was pretty disciplined around the split. Like he never spoke negatively about my mother ever. He never said a single negative word about her to me. But, you know, in terms of how it shaped me, he shaped me to have this kind of pattern, especially in romantic relationships, to completely subordinate my own needs and my own feelings even um, in service of somebody who needed boostering, bolstering, support. Mm -hmm. It made me actually positively attracted to people who were struggling, who were depressed, who were struggled with substance abuse, some of them in their past, because it felt familiar to me. And, you know, I write about this moment where I'm dating somebody and I, we we were having a conversation where it became apparent that there were some real incompatibilities between us And I said, well, maybe, you know, this just isn't going to work. Maybe this we're not right for each other. And this man tried to kill himself in front of me. He tried to jump Mm -hmm. out a window. Um, He also grabbed a knife and waved it in the air and said, "Um, why don't you just take this and stab me with it? Because that's what you've just done. Mm. And it felt like completely surreal. But at the same time, there was a weird element of familiarity in it. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, it was like, I'm important to people. I, you know, they, they, uh, they need me. They need you. Right. And you have a function. I mean, I think, listen, you know how people sometimes say there's chemistry. I have chemistry with someone. Chemistry really is that sense of ancient familiarity. It's something exactly. that is so, and, and if it's unprocessed, right? Yep. So if nobody fully processes, hey, this was the pattern with your dad, there is yep. this risk. The challenge for you is even as you climbed into adulthood, you retained a very collaborative, loving, supportive relationship with your father. And right? Exactly. Yep. That's precisely right. And so you were in yep. a very, very sort of unique situation. You know, philosophically, I will say is as a parent, I think I got about 65% of it right and 35% wrong. Your parents really didn't do it right. They did a lot right, especially your father. But what the piece that they didn't get right was unloading inappropriate emotional stuff on you and your yes. sister and placing you in a role, like not catching your, as themselves. Your father should have never said that. However, Priscilla, and this is where I'm saying it's gray. I have tremendous resonance with what you said about I had an empathy. This was a man, an adult man, in tremendous despair. He loved his daughters more than anything, and he was letting that despair show. He shouldn't have. We know that in in terms of chapter verse, he shouldn't have, but he's a human being, and, uh, you know, lives get changed over spilled glasses of apple juice because that's the stuff that pushes us over the edge. Now, I want to go back to something because this affected me a lot. Being in the McDonald's restaurant and your father sort of hoarding the salts and the peppers and the ketchups, 
I found that to be an incredibly poignant, unsettling, painful scene of a daughter seeing her titan of a father, so respected, so valued, reduced to having to hoard these kinds of condiments that you, that, that would, that there's such a complex set of emotions and I was trying to climb in there. I know you said, oh my gosh, I know he's really struggling financially, but can you, can you connect back to other feelings you had at that moment? Cause that was a lot to see. That was a lot. And, you know, and I remember also, even as I'm seeing it and I'm feeling this pang of, wow, he's even worse off than I thought. And this is alarming. I'm thinking to myself, I can't let him see that I noticed. Mm. Because I don't want him to know that I see him in all of his struggle and shame. Remember the only time that we got together as a family of four after my parents split up and we go to this musical on Broadway uh, for my sister's birthday. And Mm -hmm. she's turning 10. And I noticed that my father is crying during a love song in the show. Mm -hmm. And I, even as I'm feeling tears coming into my eyes, because I'm like, it makes me very sad to see my father so sad. I'm thinking, I I cannot let my father know that I saw this. And I'm rustling my program to make a noise, to cover the Mm -hmm. noise of my father's crying so that my mother doesn't notice it. And, you know, I like that you use the word Titan. He was a Titan. Mm -hmm. He was a cultural titan. He was in the literary um, and theatrical world of Mm -hmm. my childhood. He was revered by everybody. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, this titan, this majestic figure, who was sort of on the mountaintop with his critical pronouncements, was reduced to tipping over the bin and putting the salt in there or being reduced to helpless tears during a song in a musical. Mm -hmm. And even as I noticed it and I felt these were signs of how far he had fallen. Mm -hmm. And he was on the pedestal for me uh, and also in the culture. And in the restaurant that night before we went to the theater, my mom and my sister and I, we were already there and he arrived and he's rushing to the table and he's late and he misses the chair and he falls on the floor in the restaurant. And it was just this feeling of, Oh my, oh no, oh no, oh no, oh my gosh, get up, you know, as quickly as you can. And my mom looking at him and I could see with just a kind of contempt. And I'm just like, okay, everybody, how many Shirley Temples are we in? How many are we allowed to get? You know, what are we going to order? Oh, let's talk about the show. And sort of trying to assuage these feelings of anxiety that everybody around me has, including the waiter, my sister, I'm sort of managing everybody's feelings and quickly pivoting from my own feeling of unease to I'm going to go into that role Mm -hmm. of Mm -hmm. fixing, solving, rescuing, all of that stuff. How, How did you manage your mom's contempt? Because it was undisguised. And that is a very difficult emotion for a child to decode. It really was. Um, And it was funny because the contrast between how adored and revered my father was by everybody in our orbit and my mother's lack of reverence for him, it was very disconcerting Mm -hmm. and I didn't know how to handle it. And I couldn't figure it out. I didn't understand why my mother didn't love and respect and adore my father the way everybody else seemed to. But you know, we haven't gotten to this yet, but after my parents split up, my father said some inappropriate things. My mother said some inappropriate (laughs) things. And she, so I found a letter that my father had written to his first wife, my brother's mother, um, in which he asked her to essentially dominate him sexually. And this was when I was 10 years old. And today we would say my father had BDSM tendencies. Mm -hmm. We didn't really know how to talk about Mm -hmm. it then, Mm -hmm. especially for a man who wanted Mm -hmm. to be dominated. I think there was a lot of shame and guilt around it. And I was so confused by this letter that I went to my mom and I said, mommy, I found this letter and I described it to her. And then the floodgates opened Mm -hmm. and she started telling me I've been hiding this kind of stuff from you girls for years He has these pornography magazines that he was hiding in the cushions of the sofa that you were playing on. And I was always afraid you were going to find them. And then my mom would, you know, said to me, you know, your father had a lot of affairs. 
during our marriage. Mm. And some of them were with his graduate students. And, you know, I, I give her a lot of credit in the sense that she didn't rant and rave and demonize him in saying this. She didn't. She said she was very explicit about it. She said, he's not a womanizer. He's not a Don Juan. I couldn't give him what he wanted. And so he went elsewhere. And so I'm trying to decode what this means. And I'm like, okay, you mean you didn't want to get on top of him and whip him or mm -hmm. do whatever it was that he wanted. And so I kind of got it. It was the same thing where I had empathy for her. And I was like, oh my gosh. But I still didn't understand why she had married my father if they were so sexually incompatible. Mm -hmm. Priscilla, how old were you when you found that letter and then talked to your mother and then she let you know that he had had multiple affairs and all this other stuff. How old were you at that time? 10 years old. Okay. All right. Do you think that was an appropriate chair? Absolutely no. not. It really wasn't. And it's interesting. You're even soft peddling it now. Well, she wasn't saying he was a womanizer. In n no universe we occupy, would it ever have been okay for a child to have been handed that emotional Yep. burden to carry. It was interesting to me that she did unburden herself. The only word I could use at that point was I was frustrated when I read that. I'm like, why are you doing this to this child? <laughs> yes, she cannot stop. hear this, right? <laughs> and so it's so fascinating because for how much you were seen as a child, let me watch you do your plays with your stuffed animals and watch you perform <laughs> and all that. Yes, You weren't seen. You were simultaneously, yes, exactly. simultaneously seen and not seen, which yes. in a way is almost more confusing because the vast majority of kids who aren't seen are simply not seen. Not only is nobody plugged into their feelings, they're also not watching them do the plays and the this and the that. They're just not seen. Yeah, yeah. It was so confusing. Mm -hmm. It was mm -hmm. so confusing. And I felt so much love and affirmation from both of my parents. Mm -hmm. And so much recognition of who I truly was. But at the same time, when I discovered this idea later in life of the parentified child and yeah. the child who sort of turned into, it was interesting. I like the word that you used, that she was unburdening herself, mm -hmm. that she had been carrying this for years, and that it must have been really hard for her to watch me and Claire romping around with my father, cavorting around and playing these games. Mm -hmm. And she knows right under the cushions of that sofa there's a pornography magazine that we might find. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. we think of my father as this kind of innocent, magical being, but yeah, really yeah, he yeah. has this kind of double life when he goes up to Yale, mm -hmm. he's with his students. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I think that was frustrating to her. Right. There's a pivotal moment when your mother reads to you a passage from the Alice Miller book, Drama of the Gifted Child, and she has an epiphany. Can you read that passage to us? This was one of the few things that I couldn't pin down exactly when it happened, but it was in 1981 or 1982, soon after its publication, my mother read Alice Miller's The Drama of the Gifted Child. She devoured the book, discussed it endlessly with her friends, and scribbled notes in the margins. One evening, she urgently called me into her bedroom and told me she needed to share it with me. It explains so much about your father, she said, and about his relationship with you and Claire. It will help you understand why his love for you isn't real. I was stunned, but I stayed calm and attentive, not betraying at all how that last sentence had lacerated me. She showed me a passage, and this is from the Alice Miller book. The grandiose person is never really free. First, because he is excessively dependent on admiration from others, and second, because his self-respect is dependent on qualities, functions, and achievements that can suddenly fail. And then my mom says, this is your father. It's why I felt so drained with him. I could never give him, a, give him enough praise, and Claire refused to cater to him, so he rejected her. I thought to myself, but he didn't reject Claire. She tried his patience, mm. He yelled at her on occasion. He definitely favored me. But did he reject her? Never. When she said that to you, what did you take away from that? That my mother really didn't get it. Mm. That's what I took away from it. That my mother was slotting me and Claire into these roles where mm -hmm. I was my father's favorite. Claire was rejected. To use the terms that you started our conversation with, she was looking at it in black and white. 
She wasn't looking at the shades Mm-mm. of gray. Mm-mm. She wasn't seeing that my father affirmed and validated Claire immensely, just not as right. much as he did me. Right. And that's not good. And you don't want to do that with kids. But it wasn't a rejection. But even as I was sort of like, you're so wrong, you don't get this. I'm thinking to myself, I understand why she's doing this. It's sort of a, a similar thing to what I was describing with my father um, when he was so anguished about the, I, I, lo- I love what you said so much about spilled apple juice changes lives. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so Alice, Alice Miller's The Drama of a Gifted Child changed a lot of lives in the early 80s. And... You know, and I I was thinking to myself, my mom is trying to make sense of her relationship with my father. She's grasping. She's, why did I feel so drained? I don't get it. Oh, he needed me to affirm him constantly. And I think also she was trying to lessen her guilt about breaking up the family. Well, here's the thing. This passage, that, that passage you read from Alice... Miller, which she, in Alice Miller in many ways is taking on narcissism in that book. If any of you haven't yeah. read the drama of the gifted child who are listening to this, it's it's a classic. The grandiose person is never really free, excessively dependent on admiration from others. His self-respect is dependent on qualities and achievements and functions that can suddenly fail. That's a description of a narcissist. Exactly. That's as good as, that's as good a definition as I've read. But your mother was actually accusing your father of being narcissistic. And then she goes on, citing from the same book, that your father loved you and your sister for your false selves, which, exactly. like you said, was a total misread because from your subjective experience, you do not believe you were loved for your false self. You believed you, no. were, tr- you were truly seen and heard and that it's very possible that he was leaning on your mother for different needs, to for different kinds of validation and gratification. That's what we would expect, that an, a parent to a parent would relate differently than a parent to a child. And I think something yes. people grapple with, how can somebody be a great parent, but not such a great spouse? I'm like, because they're entirely different roles. I mean, you, I've, I've seen, <laughs> and I've seen it go the other way, where people are actually fantastic spouses, and they are absolutely abysmal parents. Yes, I've seen that too. I've seen that. You know what I'm saying? They are different roles. And some people are great people at their job and they're terrible parents and they're great spouses. You said one thing she shared with you is that your father had affairs. And in an interesting way, I wasn't even hearing that your mom was hurt by them. It was as though it was almost as though she was almost detached from the intimate part of their relationship, but almost that this is an impropriety. This is not what you do. And we see all of that now. Exactly. Exactly. And I've said this over and over again infidelity does not a narcissist make. It's a different question. And in your parents' case, it wasn't even as though it was sort of a a sexual competition thing. It was more of a a speaking to his character thing and and bringing him down in those eyes. I was just loving what you were saying about the affairs and how she didn't even, it, she wasn't personally injured by them at all. Mm-mm, no. Mm-mm. No, and that, that I found fascinating because it was a different relationship with it. And I, like I said, I think one of the reflexive things that people will often say is my spouse, partner, husband, wife, whomever had an affair they're narcissistic. And that's when I usually say, slow down. I need more. I, I understand exactly. they did something that hurt you, that betrayed that made betrayed trust that you view as questionable. That view that showed bad judgment. I can agree with all of that. However, yes. I'm not jumping to that next place until we fully exactly. understand the depth and the holistic look on this person's yes. personality. But I don't disagree with you. And I think one thing we're struggling with at this sort of time in history is everybody's using the word to describe anyone they have a problem with. And I think you're right. It also helps people feel more steadfast in their decision to distance from someone, to separate from someone. If she's like, ah, he was just a narcissistic, grandiose, admiration-seeking guy. Didn't I make the right decision? And versus... and. And maybe she could do that with her friends. My point is that people go through their processes, sure, but she was doing it with her kids. And that's that's what exactly. a lot of this challenge is. Now, exactly. One thing you had said that you'd found a diary entry that you found from middle school that you wrote. Could you read what you wrote? Because I think that that, that was something that was so telling that you not only experienced this, but actually took the time to write it down. I know. 
And I found this in 2017. I found it in a bin that was in my mother's basement. So it's a page from my diary and it's titled things not to do when I'm with daddy. Number one, don't cry. Number two, don't complain. Number three, don't be difficult. Number four, don't tell him anything but good news. Number five, don't mention mommy. Number six, don't expect him to be the daddy of old. So in, when you found that, how did it feel reading that back as an adult? I started crying mm. um, as I started reading it. And it it almost felt, this, is, this might sound strange, but... I felt like I was reading instructions that I was giving my middle school self yeah. about how to cope and contend with my father, but I was also reading instructions that I've lived by, maybe subconsciously or implicitly, for much of my life. Um, don't complain. Don't cry. Um, boost people's moods. Be the positive one. Uh, lower your expectations. All of those things. And it was a moment where I just thought, wow. All of this stuff that I've been working on in therapy and meditation, it's all right here mm -hmm. in this list. Mm -hmm. It's like a diagnosis. Why do you think you wrote it down? I think probably it was an attempt to codify mm -hmm. and give some structure mm -hmm. to these feelings mm -hmm. that I was having. And it made it feel more like an assignment mm -hmm. I almost now, it didn't occur to me until you asked that question, it almost it occurs to me now that it was a way of giving myself an assignment mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and making sure that I got an A on the assignment, that I did as well as I could possibly do. Yeah, I mean, I, I could see as an assignment, and it's, it's also a form of control, right? To be in a circumstance yes. like this, you feel deeply out of control. And yes. so taking some of that, because this, this to me it reflects tremendous emotional labor that you had to bring to every single relationship you were in. You were all the legs of the table. You know, without you, this thing couldn't stand. So, but it brings a certain level of control that comes when we write it down. It's right there. It's like, it's like a policies and procedures manual. Yes. And, you know, for how to, how to conduct yourself in that relationship. But it was, it's also quite heartbreaking. If all someone did was see this one thing, oh, this one list, it would be very easy to go to a place of, oh my gosh, this father must be a monster and this poor young girl is having to be so careful. What is so revelatory about your story is your father was anything but. He was anything but. He was an incredibly attentive doting, loving father, and an incredibly flawed, in some ways, adult man who was struggling with some real mental health crises and had been in a marriage that simply didn't work, right? None yes. of those are mortal sins. People make mistakes. They marry the wrong people and they have kids with them yep. and they love their kids and they have affairs yep. and they do all of that. That's the messiness of being a grown-up. Right. Yes. But no yes. one can take away that he was as honestly as devoted and doting a father as I think I've ever read about. And if your dad's worst moments were yelling over a glass of apple juice on a Monopoly board <laughs> and then rapidly apologizing, you know, again, the yeah. vast majority of kids who get yelled at by a parent never, ever will hear an apology. Not then and not even as adults. So, uh, again, that this list in isolation is something very different than this list in mm -hmm. context. Because this list to me is sort of the working model of a child who is headed towards codependency. Oh, yeah. Okay. So the family system you were born into really almost set you up for that. You came into the world with a temperament. And your temperament was agreeable and ebullient and cheerful and optimistic. And then you were assigned these two parents who not only created you, but shaped you. And you had a loving, attentive, playful, doting father. You had a successful, driven, equally Titan S as your father, you know, in the sense that she was also a Titan. Um, yeah. 
as you got closer to 10 years of age and you saw some of the early rumblings, I need to make sure everyone, everyone's happy. And then when your father really hit that point of despair, it became a bit of your, your full-time job. That's what you had to do. That's yeah. where that comes yeah. from. So you definitely now have that sort of codependency architecture, elevating the emotional needs and emotional worlds of other people around you above your yes. own and making yeah. psychological sacrifices to ensure the well-being and care of those around you ahead of your own, holding back on your own needs, holding back on expressing your own emotion. That's codependency, right? As it's Absolutely. typically defined. So how did that affect you as you now take this sort of codependency architecture that's been built in you? How did that show up? as you moved through adolescence and adulthood? I think it showed up mostly in my romantic relationships, mm, um, exactly. but it did yeah, yeah. a little mm -hmm. bit in the sense that the career choices that I made, I'd wanted to be an actress, I'd wanted to be a singer, my parents didn't want me to do that. Mm -hmm. And I was obedient and I gave it up when I got to Yale as an undergraduate. And I went straight into the PhD program in English literature, even though I had a lot of doubts about academia and I wasn't sure if I wanted to be a professor. Um, so it did shape me in that sense that I made my decisions about what my career was going to be based on what would make my parents happy. And in particular, what would unite them? Because I would hear them talking about, oh, she won this prize and oh, she's doing so well and isn't that great. And um, and they would be pleasant with each other around that. Uh, so I absolutely directed my life trajectory in a way that would make each of them happy as individuals and unite them in a certain kind of happiness. Um, in terms of romantic relationships, my marriage to my boy's father, he's a classic example of somebody who is an exceptional father, was not the best romantic partner, was not the best romantic partner for me. I've always been especially drawn to men who are vulnerable in some way mm. and men who either struggle with depression or um, – They've had a kind of history of substance abuse in the past. And I was drawn to men who had suffered and who had struggled. And, and I think there were a lot of good aspects to being drawn to people like that. I was drawn to people who were emotionally complicated and were able to go deep with me. And I wanted that. But my ex-husband, my boy's father, when I met him, his father had died six months earlier of MS at 54. His mother had stage four breast cancer. He was taking care of his mother. He was very, very introverted. We met in the Yale PhD program. And I'm more drawn to him because I feel this feels familiar. Mm. I can be the light giver in this relationship. And this poor, valuable, worthy human being who has suffered so much, I'm going to bring joy and light into his life. And all of his relatives would say versions of, oh, the light's back in his eyes. And you've brought, you know, mm. little Rico back to us, you know, and, and it felt incredible. And, you know, we didn't work out. My older son has autism. And we dealt with that crisis in very different ways. And he was very emotionally closed off and not really able to be there for me in the way that I was for him. So it's a version of this issue, right? Where I'm tending to him and I'm not getting enough in return. And then after my father died, I was even more drawn to people who were going through crises, struggling, mm -hmm. suffering. If a man would text me a song like, Here Comes My Girl by Tom Petty, or Mellow My Mind by Neil Young, which is all about how the woman is able to mellow the man and you know make him happy. That would be catnip. You know, I was, oh my gosh, this feels familiar. This feels like love. I had a therapist once say to me, do you think that you're trying to save these men because you couldn't save your father? Mm. Okay. Because my father died of lung cancer. Mm -hmm. He died of addiction. I mean, mm -hmm. I, he yes. was addicted. Yes. Mm -hmm. He died of his addiction. How, how did you respond to the therapist connecting the dots in that way? At first, I, I was just incredulous. I was like, how? I don't see that at all. Mm -hmm. And I remember she said something like I was describing one of these rogues uh, to her <laughs> in a therapy session. And I was saying, I don't know if I should stay with him. And she said, you don't need to be with him in order to hold on to your father. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that was another insight in the same session. Mm -hmm. And I did date one very um, flagrant narcissist mm -hmm. during this time mm -hmm. period. And I did suffer. And that's how I first discovered you. Mm -hmm. 
um, when I was researching codependency and narcissism yeah. uh, on the internet, that was really dangerous because, yeah. you know, I think if you're a giver, if you put your own needs second, if you are somebody who's used to being in that role of boosting and bolstering and buoying yeah. someone, um, narcissists are drawn to that yeah like a mo you know but i've gone on a lot of dates with narcissists and i've learned to yeah and, and one recognize thing, the signs and one thing i've said is that you know it's it's not even so much the drawn as the stuck right like you know oh, something the yes. fly the flies is, is fly might be flying around and minding its own business and then gets caught in the web it's this stuck in the web that's the problem. I yes. don't think that the fly is like, hey, spider's web. It's very similar to what happens here is that people who are codependent and who are willing to push down their emotional needs to fully prop up someone else, other people become projects. Other, you know, the, the ego gratification yes. for the codependent person yes. comes from maintaining that relationship and fully serving those needs, which also allows the codependent person to feel in control at some level too. Yes. The narcissistic person sticks around for two reasons. One is that they're still getting a steady, steady source of supply. And secondly, yeah. even when they become disinterested in the person, but still want them around because you want some supplies, so like why you keep extra toilet paper in the cabinet because you need some, you need what you need, what you need when you need it, right? Is that they know that the codependent person's not going to leave, right? Yeah. And and believe it or not, narcissistic yep. people have more abandonment crises than you would think. I think we often think of them as they're the ones abandoning everyone else. Not at all. People who are narcissistic have a lot of what we call rejection sensitivity, and that can exactly. elevate to this, this level of abandonment and fear of abandonment. It's different than sort of the fragile fear of abandonment we can see elsewhere. It's more of a, I need to stay in control. And if somebody else gets up and leaves, well, then that means I'm not in control. And that fractures that ego that a narcissistic yes. person has. So it's a little tricky because I think that the codependency framework isn't a perfect map on to what happens in narcissistic relationships. But I think it definitely is very consistent with about half of it, which is the only way a relationship with a narcissistic person works is if you completely surrender your needs exactly. to that relationship, that you put them first, that you make yep. attending to their emotions first, you in essence sacrifice yourself, and that's, the, and that's how yep. the relationship sort of sustains. And where your story was so illuminating is that I see the origin of your codependency. You were commandeered intentionally or not by two parents into serving an emotional function that you were not yet equipped to serve. Here's what's really interesting about you, Priscilla. I don't think you ever believed that love was contingent on you serving their emotional needs. I don't. I no, truly believe you I felt didn't. loved, right? Yep. But for you, it was more I'm responsible for this yes. really important system and the yes. people within this system to function. Yes. That's my responsibility. Yep. What your story reminds me is that we often write a far more shattered and damaged narrative around codependency, which your story actually isn't. Yes, yes. I could not agree with you more. And it was something that perplexed me and confused me as I was reading the literature because I was like, but I did feel seen. I did mm -hmm. feel affirmed. I mm -hmm. did feel loved. That doesn't negate the fact that they were putting a burden, an emotional burden on me. A friend once said to me, you know, in a way they were kind of turning you into their emotional support animal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's exactly <laughs> like, what wow. they were doing. That's exactly what they were doing. They, an emotional support animal. You were you were being handed the emotional luggage cart and saying, push. Your parents weren't sadistically rubbing their hands together and saying, no. how can we mess up these kids or, you know, and none of that. And again, your mom's story is significant to me in that in the 70s and when her career came up, it was much more unheard of for a woman to have a career at her level. There were no templates. There were no peers for her. And there were... Yep. Probably people sort of still giving her the side eye and still, again, they still do in 2023. It's very easy to view your mother through a very villainized lens. But when we bring in that context of the impossibility of what she was trying to pull off, 
You yes. really had to create some jagged edges around you as a woman to be able to survive in that world. And I yes. think that that may very well have bled into marriage and family. And clearly your parents' marriage was not what either of them thought that they had signed up for. Mercifully, it yielded to wonderful daughters. So it got, you know, got them something very <laughs> important. I think there was different agendas. Your father really wanted family and hearth and home and the soft place to land. Your mother's head was someplace else. And that happens. One of the kind of beautiful healing moments for me as I go through my experience with my mother is that I find out later on my mother tells me that she was never in love with my father and that she told him that mm -hmm. uh, before they got married. And she had had her heart shattered by her first great love, the writer Donald Barthelme, who was her client. And my mother said to me, and he was a depressive too, she was obviously attracted to people like that, um, that Don Barthelme revered my father intellectually mm -hmm. and that she was holding on to him in a way through being with my father. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she picked my father because my father has a son from his first marriage. Mm -hmm. She met my father for the first time with his son mm -hmm. and instantly thought, this is an incredible father. Mm -hmm. This is a good person to have children with. Mm -hmm. And we can have a great family together. Uh, our values, our ideals about art and literature and the world are aligned. I respect his mind. I think he's brilliant. And it worked until it didn't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think... You know, in some ways, your mom made an interesting choice, you know, in choosing a good father to be a partner, where she misplayed the hand was knowing she had chosen a good father, being aware he was a good father, that when the marriage fell apart, it's a shame yes. she didn't navigate that part better. Yes. Ultimately, I think it does come to a good place, but it yeah. would have saved a lot of, a, a lot of heartache. So... You, you identify as codependent. You totally own up to it. Priscilla, how are you coping with this being codependent today? Like, do you still feel responsible for other people's happiness? Much, much less. Okay. I would say I'm a recovering codependent. Okay. Um, I'm a recovering perfectionist. Um, you know, so many of the, the ways that my life has unfolded, writing two memoirs, mm where I tell the truth about hard and difficult things, and I share my struggle, and I share my sadness, that in and of itself is moving beyond codependency mm -hmm. in the sense that if you're writing a memoir, you're writing about real people, you're writing about people in your family, uh, you're taking a risk mm -hmm. that you're going to upset mm -hmm. people. And and also, you know, as a, as a doctor, um, going from academia where you have to write quote unquote, objectively, and you never put the eye into it, to writing in a more vulnerable way on the page and sharing my own story, that in and of itself is, um, I think, healing yeah. from codependency, right? I'm not getting the A anymore. I'm not in academia and jumping through the hoops and getting the gold stars and getting the tenure track, you know, because I taught at Yale on the tenure track and I taught at Vassar for four years and I love teaching and I still teach, um, but I didn't want to be in that system mm -hmm. anymore. And I catch myself. I think uh, meditation helps me a lot. I think being a meditation teacher, I'm a loving kindness meditation teacher as well as a mindfulness meditation teacher. Mm -hmm. So reminding myself to be kind and, uh, you know, my sister still helps me. Like I'll say, oh, mom was in a bad mood or something. And she'll mm -hmm. say, you don't have to worry about it. Mm -hmm. She'll be okay. Mm -hmm. um, I still do. One of the therapists that I worked with on codependency emphasized the strengths that codependents bring, right? That you're very empathic, that you're very... Uh, tuned into people, you use the word preternatural. Yeah. When I'm in, when I'm teaching, I'm yeah. able to sense um, people's what people need, how they need to be taught, maybe differently or dressed mm. differently. Mm, I love that. What do you think, though, as you've gone through your process of healing from codependency, other than writing two memoirs? What has <laughs> yes. um, what has worked best for you? And as you said, I'm in recovery. I'm a recovered codependent. What 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 was that recovery process? You know, if somebody's listening to this saying, I'm codependent, what works? What works? Books. Um, I'm looking at them. I have my microphone stacked on Melody Beattie's book. I watched endless videos um, from people that I really trusted. Mm -hmm. And that's how I found you a few years ago. Um, meditation, mindfulness. I went to some CODA meetings. I did. 
um, when I was first in recovery. Right. And so for people listening, CODA is Codependence Anonymous, which is a 12-step program focused on people Mm -hmm. recovering from Mm -hmm. codependency. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. And I think that for me, because it was particularly manifesting in a negative way in the realm of my dating life, Mm -hmm. uh, I started dating very mindfully. Mm -hmm. Um, Stan Tapkin is a guy who I really like, who has good stuff on attachment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, And really taking my time and going slow. It used to be something like I got engaged to my kid's father after four months. Um, and I was the kind of person that like get into something. It was like, oh, it was amazing. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. um living living with that chemistry and and um I love what you said in the beginning about chemistry. I with with the narcissist that I described, I had the most intense chemistry I've ever had mm-hmm, in, in mm-hmm. on any date, on the first date. It was like crazy chemistry. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I've learned to be skeptical of that. I've learned to ask the right questions yes. when I'm dating, yes, to not uh, get sucked in by what now I know to call love bombing. Thanks Thank to you, you. Um, <laughs> you know it's not just warp mm-hmm. and right um, affection. It's love bombing um, to make myself stronger so that I can't be manipulated. How did becoming a mom affect your healing process? You know, my both of my children have special needs. So my older son uh, was given the autism diagnosis when he was twelve, but had all sorts of speech. Mm-hmm motor issues, um, would, would get the autism diagnosis at three now, but it was 2002 and we didn't know as much. Mm -mm. My younger son was profoundly dyslexic and dysgraphic. They both struggle with OCD. So I, and I think the caretaking stuff and the advocacy stuff and the empathy stuff was fantastic for these kids. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, I knew how to do it. Yeah. Uh, and I think, but I think it also gave me a lot more empathy for little Priscilla because seeing their vulnerability and seeing them at nine, them at 10, them at 11, and thinking, I cannot imagine ever saying anything remotely close to what my parents said to me, to my children. Right. I, it's just unfathomable to me. So that was healing too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I love that. And, and I also, I really love how you talked about codependency, interestingly, has its gifts. I think that's such oh, a does. beautiful, beautiful framing of that because I think that, and I think it's cultural. I think that we pathologize emotion, we pathologize need, but codependency, when a person can get themselves out of the vortex of exhausting themselves in the name of other people, what you yes. uncover under that is a tremendous empathy, a self-awareness, and a, well, yeah, and a self-awareness, but more than that, an awareness of others, a um, a uh, a compassion. It's really about channeling those gifts, if you will, of codependency, because I think what exactly. happens is it gets co-opted into something that's a that's actually harmful in the hands of a person in the wrong relationship. You know, the one thing I want to. Um, I do want to say that people listening to this are often tuning in to hear about more of the narcissistic abuse stuff. But many of this, those folks are saying, well, I also want to hear the codependency piece. So, you know, Priscilla, today you gave us an opportunity to have that important conversation. Yeah. You know, there are some differences in that. I think with narcissistic abuse, there's a lot of overlap. I think a lot of people who experience narcissistic abuse, especially when it's legacy narcissistic abuse, meaning that it it originated in childhood, there we see a lot of the codependency stuff because it's survivalist, right? It was a safety need to be able to cater to the emotions and the needs of others and to surrender one's own needs so they can ensure that they maintain safety and get their attachment needs met. However, there's a lot of people out there, many people listening, who are who they encountered their first major narcissistic relationship in adulthood. And so in those cases, it's actually not codependency and it becomes narcissistic abuse and the fallout of narcissistic abuse, which is absolutely chaotic confusion. Whereas codependency, it's almost (laughs) built into the emotional DNA. And so for folks listening to this, there are differences. There's also a lot of overlap and it's also quite conceivable. People have the separate phenomenon of narcissistic abuse made worse because they already have a codependent style. And that sounds like that's what happened to you. That is absolutely what happened to me. Yes, 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 yes. I also yes. have to say that I was getting frustrated with your mom in your in your memoir because you know she really had left you, feeling as though Dad's love for you was some sort sort of narcissistic projection or some loving of your yep. false self. 
but she did come around. And if you could just sort of maybe that would be a good place to end is sure. what, how she, yeah. what she shared with you. Yeah. I, I, in the process of writing, of writing the book, uh, I actually got up the courage and this, I guess, is part of my, my healing, um, process from codependency and and sharing my feelings with her and I confronted her and I mm -hmm. used that word deliberately and advisedly I confronted her and I said why did you reduce his love for me to narcissistic projection in some way and she immediately said I was completely wrong I didn't understand what narcissism was I had felt exhausted taking care of him and I didn't want you to make the same mistake mm. and then I sent her an email and I said why did you marry my father? I need to have it in writing. She sent me this email where she affirmed, I'm not going to quote it exactly correctly, but she said, you know, I admired his brilliant mind and he was an excellent father. Basically, he was a kind and ethical man. Mm -hmm. And I remember reading these words and I just started sobbing and I put my head down on this desk and I was like, these are the words that I was waiting to hear for 40 years. And it also confirmed for me that I had been correct about my mom in the sense that I knew that she was trying to protect me with everything she was telling me. It was misguided. It was wrong. You shouldn't ever tell those things to a 10 year old. But I still did feel that she did it out of love and protectiveness mm -hmm, for me, mm -hmm. however misguided mm -hmm. it might have been. I, I'll, I'll be cynical and honest for a minute. Some people, listen, some listeners might even say, well, is she rationalizing it? And that's not actually how I see it. There's a mm -hmm. difference between rationalizing and making meaning and sense out of what happened to you. Yes. And I'm hearing the meaning making and the sense making, which is really important. I wish she had told you this earlier. I think it would have set you free in a very different way. But I think for you to really hear that she knew that he loved you and that he was a decent man, an ethical man, was just it was a closing of a circle for you. You knew that all along but that you yes. needed to understand some of that from her too, that one of the greatest gifts that can happen in our life, and I don't think it can ever happen too late, is a moment where we feel like our experience is really seen and perceived. So you got some. Yes, I really did. And yeah. even as I'm like depicting my father in this book, you know, he valued mystery. And I, mm -hmm. I can't solve my father. Mm -hmm. I, I think, I hope this is useful to people who are listening, right? You're never going to get to a definitive mastery of your no, past no. or your experience or these characters. The best you can do is just sort of see them with all of their contradictions, many contradictions, see the good, see the darker stuff and make sense of it and always know that any human being is going to exceed Correct. a label or a category yeah. or a diagnosis. Yeah. And, and it's interesting, my final point, People yep. are complicated, and if we communicate them right, someone's always going to have a bone to pick, which means you did a great job. So again, I can't <laughs> tell you what a pleasure it was, Priscilla. So grateful to you for this stunning book and for your time, and just glad you're out in the world. It just makes me happy to know there's people out there. Oh like my you. gosh, I can't tell you how glad I am that you're Thank in the you. world. Thank I, you. I, you've been such a blessing to me. I appreciate that. And. It's such an incredible honor. Thank you. And this conversation, I had high expectations, I have to say, but like, this exceeded them by- Oh, that's like, good. <laughs> oh my God, you you helped me. So take good care. All my best to you, my dear. You're the All best. Right. Be Thank well. you, you so too. much. Thank you. Here are my takeaways from my conversation with Priscilla. In my first takeaway, in many ways, Priscilla's story is a primer on parenting, what to do and what not to do. Her father, despite his flaws as a man, was by Priscilla's recollection, a patient, empathic, engaged, and loving father, celebrating his daughter's talents, interests, and intellects. However, none of that is enough to supersede a difficult marriage with her mother, and while her parents did get some things right, her story is a reminder that it is never appropriate to burden a child with a parent's emotions, needs, and despair. Parenting is an act of will, boundaries, and discipline, with parents needing to find appropriate outlets for their emotions. Children are far more perceptive than adults at emotional nuance because they need to be perceptive to survive. 
Sadly, that can mean a child can take on those unfairly shared emotional burdens and devote their emotional bandwidth to appeasing and soothing their parents. That's not how it's supposed to work. For our next takeaway, what is codependency? Part of the problem is that there really is not an agreed upon definition. The American Psychological Association's Dictionary of Psychology defines it as the state of being mutually reliant. For example, a relationship between two individuals who are emotionally dependent on one another. It has definitely morphed from there into something less mutual and generally refers to one person putting another person's emotional needs ahead of their own and taking responsibility for the emotions of another person, often to their own detriment. This term gets messy when we talk about similar dynamics, such as those we see in people going through narcissistic abuse, because in narcissistically abusive relationships, people often take the blame for what is happening in the relationship and slowly sacrifice their identities, needs, and emotional expression to avoid the wrath and anger of the narcissistic person. While people may be codependent in narcissistic relationships, the two are not synonymous. In Priscilla's case, she acknowledges being codependent within a system where she felt loved and did not feel that she gave up her identity or sense of self, nor did she feel that she was conditionally loved and that the emotional heavy lifting she did was to protect her parents. In the case of a child with a narcissistic parent, they have to construct a narrative in which they are loved and then blame themselves for the parent's chronic anger and rage. The child believes they cannot be themselves, but rather only be what the parent needs. There is a lot of overlap between what happens in a narcissistic relationship and codependency, and ultimately the way we manage these relationships in therapy is similar. But the survival function of taking on those emotional burdens in a narcissistic family system are different than we see in some codependent families. For this next takeaway, Codependency assumes that the codependent person is also experiencing a maladaptive condition themselves. The term codependency has its roots in the 1940s alcoholism literature. Which is why I do not think it can always be applied to people experiencing narcissistic abuse. Many people in narcissistic relationships did not understand what they were dealing with, do not want to endure it, but for a variety of reasons may be stuck, including culture, religion, financial necessity, genuine fear of post-separation abuse or fallout, or familial rejection and caregiving responsibilities. They are not deriving some secondary benefit and instead are faced with an impossible choice. Codependency does remain a controversial term in the psychological literature, and while it was a framework that resonated for Priscilla, does not necessarily provide a framework for everyone in an emotionally imbalanced relationship. In this next takeaway, Priscilla calls herself a recovering codependent and shared a list of things that have helped her, including books, videos, meditation and mindfulness practices, 12-step groups such as Codependence Anonymous, and slowing way down in new relationships. Many of these tools can be quite useful for survivors of narcissistically abusive relationships as well. And for our last takeaway, a piece of Priscilla's story that sticks with me was when she said, we can never have mastery of the past. And that may be one of the heaviest burdens and greatest challenges for folks who have experienced complex childhoods, which is most of us. It's like chasing a mirage and the attempt to fully make sense of the experience of emotionally confusing childhood, whether or not you had a narcissistic parent, can pull us out of our present and the opportunity to be fully in the present moment as ourselves and 
walk forward into healing.